The details behind the curious case of U.S. sailor Peter Mims involve a struggling sailor that sparked a massive, multinational, 5,500 square mile search across the Philippine Sea for a man overboard. Meanwhile, the ship's crew continued a hopeful yet fruitless search for him inside the claustrophobic bowels of the ship's engineering spaces. Mims was reported missing the evening of June 8, 2017 and was presumed to have fallen overboard the USS Shiloh, which was conducting routine operations about 180 miles off the coast of Okinawa, Japan. U.S. and Japanese ships spent more than 50 hours searching for him, assisting by helicopters and other aircraft from Shiloh, USS McCampbell, USS Barry, USS John S. McCain, and USS Ronald Reagan. The massive search was suspended on June 11th, with the presumption that he was lost to the sea. During the search, the crew reported that a 60-pound weighted workout vest was missing, which added to concerns that Mims had thrown himself overboard. Sailors were posted to the exterior of the ship with night vision goggles and spotlight watches set up, as it was believed Mims was not aboard the ship. On June 11th, the search was called off and Mims was presumed dead, Rear Admiral Charles Williams said, quote, The decision to suspend the search was not arrived at lightly. Our thoughts are with our lost shipmate, his family, and the officers and crew of the USS Shiloh. End quote. The Shiloh crew continued to hopelessly search for the ship after the surface and air searches were canceled, and the crew was in the process of planning a memorial service for MIMS. Peter Mims joined the Navy in February 2014 and reported to the Shiloh the following August. Shipmates described him as small but strong, able to bench press twice his 150-pound body weight. He was rated as a mechanical gas turbine systems technician, third class, and had previously earned the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. The command counseled him in 2015 for being late on completing job qualifications. In 2016, he was busted by base security at Yokosuka, Japan after drinking and falling asleep on a bench, which led him to being designated a liberty risk and prohibited from drinking alcohol. Mims had financial problems. His marriage had fallen apart and his chain of command was writing him about qualifications. He sought mental health counseling, but was not treated when he needed it most. Mims was known for outlandish claims such as he could stop running the engineering department engines by pulsating electricity within his body, that he could shoot fireballs out of his hands, that he had a friend who had a motorcycle which had the same engine as the one aboard the ship, that he had been to space, and that before he joined the Navy, he was going to work for NASA because he had reached the pinnacle of how strong a human could be. Mims filed for a divorce later that year. He failed to report the divorce for months and was overpaid for housing as a result, leaving him indebted to the Navy for about $7,000. Mims was supporting his family and ex-wife while repaying the Navy for overpaid wages. According to shipmates, he only kept $40 from each paycheck for himself. At the beginning of the year, another Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser, the USS Antietam, had run aground in Tokyo Bay near her home port of Yokosuka, Japan. Antietam was anchored off the coast in 30 knot winds and a strong tide when the crew noticed that the ship was dragging its anchor. Although there were no fatalities when the USS Antietam had run aground in Tokyo, the missions of Shiloh were reportedly multiplied. Such a workload placed a significant amount of stress on the Shiloh sailors, an investigation later reported. Sailors in MIMS engineering department reported extreme work hours, with one telling investigators that they'd slept only three hours a night. The engineering department were not the only ones affected. Crew surveys depicted a crew suffering from overwork, depression, and rock-bottom morale under the then-skipper Captain Adam Icock. One Shiloh sailor had said that Mim seemed off in the last couple of weeks, in a different way than during his divorce. Mims decided that he was no longer considering re-enlistment and wanted out of the Navy. The day before he went missing, Mims went to his chain of command to discuss options for leaving the Navy early. 
then went and cleared out his workspace locker, informing shipmates that he was spring cleaning. Mims made a call and then told the ship's command master chief that he believed another sailor had a poisoning scheme against him that involved injecting him with a needle. He had a history of paranoia. In the past, Mims showed another sailor how he had placed tape on his rack and vents of his locker to prevent anyone from sticking items in his area to frame him. He believed his computer access was being monitored and that his family was in danger because he had previously told a shipmate where they live. Mims appeared jumpy later that afternoon, according to other sailors, but he said that he was okay and he wasn't going to harm himself or anyone else. He said he wasn't depressed, but he had decided that he was going to get out of the Navy. He reported for his watch shift just before 6 p.m. After he failed to check in at about 8 p.m., the engineering commanding officer on watch waited for about 30 minutes before logging Mims as missing. The engineering then contacted the officer on deck at about 9.06 p.m. and asked for them to order Mims to report over the ship's intercom. After the intercom message failed to yield results, the engineering officer recommended commanders initiate man overboard protocol for mustering purposes, which would spark a ship-wide head count. Captain Icock was confident Mims would be found. Quote, He didn't kill himself. He's on the ship. Keep searching for him. End quote. Captain Icock believed Mims wanted to leave the Navy, but it assessed that Mims had not presented as suicidal or shown any signs of self-harm. Eventually, the executive officer headed to the bridge and again recommended man overboard be initiated. Icock finally acquiesced at 9.24 p.m. and the Shiloh changed course and began steaming towards its original location in the Philippine Sea when Mims first went missing. By 1 a.m. on June 9th, the Shiloh's crew reported that all spaces had been searched, and Icock suspended the rescue effort at 2 a.m. to allow for crew rest. After his disappearance, shipboard searchers reported that they were operating under the assumption that they were searching for an injured or sleeping shipmate. After more than 50 hours of searching, the sea search for MIMS was called off around midnight local time June 11th, and a casualty assistance officer notified his family that their son was presumed dead. However, social media had relayed the news first. The missing sailor's mother and father were already aware that the search and rescue operations were called at about six hours before the official notification was received. On the morning of his June 8th disappearance, a crew member spotted who he believed to be Mims raiding a snack station on the ship. Foraging for Pop-Tarts and granola bars, looking squirrely all the while. The crew member told investigators that Mims darted back into the shadows upon being spotted. Shockingly, many hours after his initial disappearance, his Navy cash card was used to purchase soda from a vending machine near the engine room. During a search in Shiloh's aft portion, a bottle filled with urine was found in an ammunition elevator near the trash room. Then, just one day after the search and rescue efforts were halted, a sailor reported seeing him at about 4 a.m. on June 12th, walking through a lounge area. The sailor cautiously approached Mims, who was covered in rust and carrying a 34-gallon plastic bag filled with water. Mims told the sailor who spotted him that people were trying to kill him and that there were hidden messages in the movie titles listed in the plan of the day. Terrified by how erratic Mims was, the sailor did not report it immediately. The sailor stated that he was scared of Mims and that Mims could physically beat him in a fight. Mims walked off and the sailor went back to his berthing area to sleep for about 90 minutes. At about 6 a.m., the sailor awoke and told the command about seeing Mims. But the sailor's story was not believed by the chain of command. The sailor was in the midst of being disciplined for an unrelated matter which caused credibility problems on his account. The command master chief, along with several senior NCOs, spent hours conducting another search for MIMS, but did not inform the other officers or seek their help. They were bound to get to the bottom of this with or without their officer counterparts. By now, the entire ship had been cleared top to bottom, except for the main engine room two catacombs, a tight-fitting series of stiffeners and ribs beneath the engine modules. Only engine room one's area was fully cleared because the stench and extreme heat in engine room two was too overwhelming to search through. The overwhelmingly putrid scent? 
was believed to be fuel and oil. An explosive ordnance disposal platoon from Reagan flew to Shiloh on the morning of June 15th. Captain Icock told them that portions of the engine room catacombs had been searched, but the entire area had not been cleared due to safety concerns. Based on the small size of the space and the unknown state of Mims's mind, fearing the safety of their personnel, they did not complete the catacomb search, which requires crawling through a series of small compartments. The EOD team suggested manning all entrance and exit points to the engine rooms and not approaching Mims until they could verify he was not a threat. Icock got on the ship's intercom at about 1 p.m. to explain the new search plan. He started talking to Mims like he knew he was listening. The EOD team, armed with batons and zip-tie handcuffs, began a renewed search. Sailors in the engine room 2's catacombs reported finding an aviator's bag kit, a trash bag, sweatpants, a charger, and soda cans. They also reported a strong smell of feces and urine. It was hot everywhere and extremely tight, as well as red sludge everywhere, a chief later wrote in a statement. At about 2 p.m. on June 15th, a sailor opened an exit passage from engine room 2 and felt resistance. The sailor saw Mims, and he thought he was dead. He then bumped Mims with the door again. This is when he woke up. The shocked sailor backed away and left the area, letting Mims out of his sight. The sailor sat there for a few minutes and collected himself before going back. He had found Mims, covered in urine and feces. He had a camelback for water. He had a multi-tool, Peeps candy, and an empty peanut butter jar with him. The escape passage area where Mims was found was noticeably cooler than the main engine room. Mims asked what all the commotion was about in that part of the ship. The sailor responded, Everyone's been looking for you for over a week. Mims told the sailor he hid because Icock and the command master chief wouldn't let him leave the ship. The sailor persuaded Mims to turn himself in, then told Mims to stay put while he notified his supervisor. After he was found, Mims was taken to the chief's quarters where he declined food and water, but took a shower and changed his clothes. The command master chief told him that he can call his family, but Mims declined. Mims did not have a plan upon being found, nor did he have a plan for whether he would eventually reveal himself or try to escape from the ship in Singapore. About a week later, a former electrician's mate studied how Mims had managed to stay hidden from his shipmates. Foot traffic coming toward engine room 2 could be heard ahead of time, which would have allowed Mims to hide before he was spotted. The area was full of dark spaces where he could hide undetected from passing sailors, and nearby escape trunk led to the outside. The hallways are very dark and would lend themselves easily to someone who wanted to remain hidden. After taps is played, the evening foot traffic was very light, and the only personnel who transited the engineering spaces were watchstanders who were focused on taking logs. The investigation found, quote, Given Mim's knowledge of the spaces, it is highly likely he could have been able to easily evade the ship's search force. Mims is a very small person. His small stature allowed him to more comfortably move around the smaller engineering spaces than others. He is also well known within the engineering department for spending lots of time exploring the passages in those places. End quote. Mims later told investigators that he went into hiding because he was concerned for his own safety, according to an interview summary. As evidence of what Mims believed to be a threat to his safety, he recommended the crew surveys be looked at. Mims seemed paranoid and appeared to be holding back some information. Mims later told investigators that he went into hiding because he was concerned for his own safety. The report continues, quote, As evidence of what Mims believed to be a threat to his safety, he recommended the crew surveys be looked at. Mims seemed paranoid and appeared to be holding back some information, end quote. Mims was a below average sailor who tended to be unreliable and untruthful outside basic duties, according to the investigation. Despite this, his most recent evaluation prior to his disappearance states that Mims' stellar performance has proven his high regards for mission success through teamwork and training. His superior also wrote, He has earned my utmost trust and confidence. The evaluations concluded with must promote. This evaluation was not provided to Mims due to his unauthorized absence at the time. The USS Shiloh sailor, who was presumed lost at sea, only to be found a week later in the ship's engine room, 
was freed from the brig while awaiting court-martial. Mims admitted during his disciplinary proceedings that he had actively avoided searches conducted by the ship's crew during his week-long disappearance. The 23-year-old sailor was charged with uniform code of military justice violations, including abandoning watch, failure to obey an order or regulation, and for dereliction in the performance of duties. According to the manual for court-martial, Violations that involve a willful dereliction of duty carry a maximum punishment of a bad conduct discharge, forfeiture of all pay and allowances, and confinement for up to six months. His commanding officer ordered a reduction in rank and a suspended pay forfeiture sentence. Navy records show that on December 20th, he reported to a transient personnel unit and received an administrative separation. He left the service as an E-2. Over the course of his three years on the ship, Mims developed and refined his ability to hide and remain undetective, even directly taunting his shipmates who would look for him. Several of Mims' peers recalled him saying, If you are looking for me and you can't find me, then you are looking too hard. Mims' unauthorized absence is not an entirely unique story. According to multiple reports from sailors who served with 7th Fleet at the time, an electronic technician 3rd class went missing for a week, a fellow shipmate was charged with his murder, flown off the ship, and incarcerated. The missing petty officer was found later when he answered his phone. An airman aboard a 7th Fleet aircraft carrier also went missing for eight days before being caught. He was caught when he was attempting to exit the ship in a foreign port. I requested information from sailors who were aboard the USS Shiloh between 2016 and 2018. Some sailors labeled the USS Shiloh the USS Bread and Water. Sailors sent to the brig by Captain Icock would be faced with the old-timey punishment of being served nothing but bread and water during their stay. Icock would hold special hearings for these punishments at midnight. This was to ensure the maximum length of the sentence was inflicted. Mim's disappearance and subsequent media circus ultimately drew attention to this antiquated punishment. The Navy would finally end the bread and water practice in 2019. The British Royal Navy ended the practice in 1891. Icock was not a man to empower his senior enlisted staff. He subjected them to captain's mass punishments and provided them little authority or autonomy to carry out orders. Captain Icock remembers his performance differently, writing in his LinkedIn profile, quote, led 350 of the nation's best and brightest in a multi-warfare capable Ticonderoga class cruiser during a period of high operational tempo while also achieving the highest retention, selection, and promotion rates. End quote. Command climate surveys reveal an exhausted and demoralized crew. They question the ship's readiness to respond to missile threats from North Korea. They painted Captain Icock as a tyrant. Icock responded to these complaints with quote, anonymous surveys and complaints by privileged groups and individuals that do not perform and who were held accountable do not reflect the health and success of the command, end quote. Casual disregard for command climate surveys is very alarming. These surveys can lead to the dismissal of a command team and are taken very seriously by the Navy. The Inspector General recommended the report be forwarded up ICOC's chain of command for corrective action and asked the Navy leaders to determine why the Shiloh's troubling command climate survey results did it not spark corrective actions by his superiors. ICOC responded to IG that his warship excelled operationally with the highest operational tempo among the four deployed cruisers. His response did not convince the investigator, who wrote of that, quote, Proof of abusive behavior is not refuted simply by stating that the operational commitments went well, end quote. The Group 5 leadership team took the opposite approach of IG. Even after the third dismissal survey, Group 5 leaders stated that Shiloh's impressive performance trumped the rock-bottom morale of the crew that enabled the performance in the first place. One of ICOC's superiors stated, quote, The Shiloh's impressive string of operational successes at sea and other indicators provide a countervailing indication of the command climate from the results of the command climate survey, end quote. ICOC could be petty and demanding. The search for Peter Mims was concluded after three days and he was labeled lost at sea. 
However, Icock ordered the search and procurement of his favorite soda, Sundrop, which endured so long that an IG complaint was filed. IG responded that spending considerable time searching for an unnecessary beverage is not official duty. Icock would downplay the extent of the Sundrop fiasco, but numerous officers recalled funneling hundreds of man hours into the search at Icock's command. It makes sense that Icock would drink Sundrop. It had 9 milligrams more caffeine than Mountain Dew. Icock would routinely brag about sleeping only two hours at night. One officer said, quote, It was work harder, sleep less. What are you doing? You shouldn't be eating. You have other things to do. So he came down really hard on his officers in the war room, end quote. Another officer recalled meetings with Icock as being a game of Russian roulette. You aren't sure who's going to get their head bitten off by Icock, but it's going to be somebody. Adam Icock's last command concluded in August of 2017, shortly after Peter Mims was found. He's now a senior analyst and program advisor for a company in Alabama. Mims also transitioned out of the Navy. Given his separation was administrative and not bad conduct, he still qualifies for some veterans' benefits. One sailor reported that he had grown out his hair and has returned to his home state to be closer with his family. It is in my summation that Mims's actions were a desperate response to an incredibly difficult situation. He was a young man with limited operational experience, dealing with financial, marital, and mental health issues. Icock once callously stated that his heart was two sizes too small when a sailor was facing administrative discharge for mental health issues. He went on to claim that able recruits are lined up at the recruiter station, so they need to separate those that cannot perform. Mims demonstrated that there is a humanity in sailors. Unlike the cold mechanical functions of the ship, sailors have human needs to address. The Navy is nothing without the men and women that comprise it. Mims likely never planned or anticipated how his actions in 2017 would impact the Navy. He drew attention to a systemic callousness in their chain of command. He was just a pawn that ultimately checkmated a king.